Halo. Halo. Should be up. Halo. Let's see. Is my sound up? Okay, so uh, welcome to uh, this Q&A session on principles of taxation and advanced uh, taxation. I see some of you joining us on uh, YouTube as well. Uh, if there are any questions you have, principles of taxation, advanced taxation, uh, you put it in the chat for me, for those of you joining us on YouTube. Uh, Oday Kwetia said, hello, hi, Oday. Uh, thanks for joining us on the live stream. And then Joseph Bab said, hi. Hello, Joseph. Thanks for joining us as well on the live stream today. Uh, we're looking at principles of taxation and advanced taxation. That is the papers. Well, these are the papers we have tomorrow. So we are looking at a Q&A uh, on these two papers. So if there are any questions you have, you put them in the chat for me, for those of you on YouTube, uh, and I'll be providing you with some answers in that regard. Suleimana Abubakar said, hi, hi Shira. Good evening. Hello, Suleimana. Thanks for joining us on the live stream. If there are any questions, put it in the chat for me and uh, I will provide you with answers. Principles of taxation and advanced taxation. Uh, we want to look at what we can do and uh, the various things that we need to focus on as we go into the exam hall tomorrow uh, in that regard. So Whatever questions, put it in the chat. For those of you joining us, uh, joining on the Zoom, you raise your hand, I'll bring you up, or better still, you can put it in the chat for me for any questions that you have uh, so that I can provide you with some answers as we begin with our discussion. Uh, Joseph Mumbi said, hi, my man. Hello, Joseph. Thanks for joining us on the live stream. Um, Richmond Tieku. <laughs> Asari said, what areas should we focus more on advanced taxation? Because they are changing the trends of the papers. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to be sharing my thought on that, Richmond. Stay tuned. I'm going to be sharing my screen, and we'll go through that in a moment. Godwin in Tiamwa said, boss, uh, good job. We appreciate your time. Always a pleasure. Uh, Godwin, thanks for joining us. If you join us, come on, give us a thumbs up on the video. It helps us a lot. Odea Kwetia said, can we do some summary of minerals tax that is advanced taxation definitely why not so if there are any questions you have just put it in the chat that is the purpose for this q a as we get excited in the discussion for today so i'm seeing a chat also on zoom here Eben said uh uh hi inshira good evening good evening uh please brief us on thin capitalization concept okay okay we're going to be taking that uh as well Let's see what I have. Give me a moment. Let me just. Okay, so thin capitalization. Okay, hey Ben, gonna take that. Um, so on YouTube, more or less like advanced taxation, people are taking the class today. Okay, we're going to be addressing all of them. Okay, Joseph on Zoom, your hand is, hey, James, sorry, on Zoom, your hand is up. Uh, please come up quickly. Yes, James. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, tired, bro. Yeah, definitely. You yeah, have please, uh, I want, I want uh, if you can, uh, throw more light on uh, measures, principal uh, measures when the uh, underlining. You mean major arrangements? Is this network not good or something like that? Okay, I think I heard about measures. I don't know. Okay, so, okay. Then thin capitalization from um, 
Eben, I think think capitalization will cut across for the principles of taxation students as well. And then Godwin in Tiamo Owusu said, uh, please let us know when and how to gross up other income and the popular statement that comes with it. Okay, okay, yeah, dealing with other incomes. That's also in principles of taxation and advanced taxation. Um, areas to focus on in advanced taxation. Just want to prepare my slide based on the questions I have so far. And then mining, minerals, uh, taxation, in advanced taxation. Okay, all right. Okay, so let me share my screen and then uh, we'll start a discussion and get excited about it. If there are any questions, you put it in the chat for me or you raise your hand, I bring you up for those of you joining on Zoom. But for those of you who are with me on uh, YouTube, put your questions in the comment section, in the chat, sorry, and I'm going to be replying to them. So let me bring up my screen quickly, then we go. We ready? Let's see. Coming up. Okay, there we go. Let's see, let me open my chats also here so that when they come, I will not forget. Right, so first things first, I mean, let's begin with uh, on an even tone uh, before we get excited about it. Uh, we've mentioned that when it comes to dealing with uh, advanced taxation, there are a couple of issues that we need to understand, a couple of issues that will be in the exam hall that we need to uh, pay attention to. The issue about corporate tax liabilities, we've mentioned that over and over again. So the principles relating to corporate tax liabilities. Now, under corporate tax liabilities is a broad issue there. That is where you need to know about uh, dealing with uh, interest on loans, interest on loans uh, and foreign exchange. When the loan is from a non-resident person, I'm going to explain that. That is where the thin capitalization comes in. Dealing with issues about finance cost uh, and finance gain. Dealing with issue about finance cost and finance gain. We're going to go into that. Dealing with issues about dividend or other income received. which was a question that someone asked on uh, YouTube. I'm going to be referring to that also. Carryover of losses. I mean, these are principles you need to pay attention to very well. And, and others, we will see how many of them we can deal with. Then certainly dealing with issues about capital allowance. I mean, there are principles that governs this. We're going to be going running up to speed with all these uh, in that regard. So in advanced taxation in... Uh, principles of taxation, corporate tax liability, you cannot run away from it. It's something that is going to be basic, fundamental, especially for principles of taxation. For advanced taxation students, this will be a basic introductory area that we need to pay attention to and look out for in the exam hall. But most importantly, when we are dealing with principles, sorry, uh, corporate tax liabilities, we must be able to distinguish between allowable deductions allowable deductions, and then non-allowable deductions. Very important. It's that, that's going to be uh, crucial to us as we go into the exam hall. What should be allowable? What should not be allowable? We're going to be coming on to that. So corporate tax liabilities is going to be fundamental, very basic. Whether we are in advanced taxation or we are in uh, corporate uh, <laughs> principles of taxation in the exam hall. That is the first key thing that we need to look out for. But most importantly, the treatment of the things that I have listed here. Because sometimes the examiner may not bring a full corporate tax liability question to you. He will bring you a note for five, eight, seven, three marks on how some of these things are supposed to be dealt with. And in the exam hall, you should have the ability to be able to write out the English necessary to explain what exactly is going on in the exam or what exactly is going on in the scenario. So that is, that is a, 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 the first key aspect that we need to look out for, we need to know about in this particular uh, scenario. Now, because I don't want to expand on it a little bit uh, too much, I'm going to take them one after the other and then share my thoughts uh, briefly on them. 
So this question came from Eben Owusu said, uh, I should briefly explain the concept of thin capitalization. The idea is that when a resident entity, okay, when a resident entity, okay, uh, borrows money, okay, borrows money from a non-resident entity or a non-resident investor, the interest on the loan notes or the interest on the loan may be deductible for tax purposes, okay? The interest of the loan may be deductible for tax purposes, may be deductible for tax purposes. Now, remember, I didn't say is deductible. I said may be deductible. The reason why the word may be deductible is because of that, of the fact that the deductibility of the interest on the borrowed fund from a non-resident investor is subject to the thin capitalization concept. And also the same thing that happens is that once we borrow the money from the foreign or from a foreign or non-resident investor, there may be a foreign exchange loss. Now, the deductibility of the foreign exchange loss is also the same thing. It may be deductible for tax purposes. But these two items will be based on the thin capitalization concept. So the law states that the Income Tax Act states that for interest and the foreign exchange loan should be deductible for tax purposes, the debts Okay, that will be allowable for tax purposes, shall not exceed, okay, so shall be greater than, less than or equal to three times the equity of the company. Three times the equity of the entity. Okay, so the debt allowable for tax purposes shall not exceed three times the equity of the company. What does that mean? When we say equity at this level, we mean the share capital of the company and income surplus or retained earnings. They are used interchangeably. They are the same thing at the end of the day. So at the beginning of the year, our share capital and income surplus, when we add the two together, that gives us the equity. The debt allowable for tax purposes shall not exceed three times the equity. That is the concept of our thin capitalization. So what does that mean? It means if our debt allowable is less than three times the equity of the entity, then what is going to be happening is that all the interest expenses we incurred for the year on the loan notes, okay, on the loan, as well as any foreign exchange loss that we had when we were paying the loan notes, because it should be realized not unrealized foreign exchange, I'll talk about that later, then all these will be allowable for tax purposes. All shall be allowable for tax purposes. Why? Because your debt allowable is less than three times the equity of the company. But then if the debt allowable is greater than three times the equity of the company, then you need to calculate to limit how much interest will be allowable for tax purposes. So the way we work that out is that the interest allowable for tax purposes, the interest allowable for tax purposes shall be equal to the debt allowable, which is three times the equity, divided by the total debt at the beginning of the year times the interest expenses incurred during the year. That figure, sorry, no dollars here, without due respect to our Ghana cities, we got to sink for Ghana cities. That interest is going to be the allowable. Does that make sense? So what we are saying here is that if our uh, debt allowable, it's less than three times the equity of the entity, then all the interest expenses we incurred, all the foreign exchange laws we incurred shall be allowable for tax purposes shall be allowable for tax purposes. But then if what happens is that the debt stock of the entity, okay, the debt of the entity is uh, greater than three times the equity of the entity. Let me make this one well. 
this should be the debt of the entity. This should be the debt of the entity, the debt outstanding. Let me correct that. So if the debt outstanding is less than three times the equity of the entity, all the interest expenses, all the foreign exchange losses we incurred shall be allowable for tax purposes. But if the debt outstanding is greater than three times the equity of the company, then the interest allowable shall be the debt allowable, which is three times the equity of the company divided by total debt times the interest expenses. So that any interest not allowable shall be added back to the profit of the entity. So the interest not allowable would simply be equal to the interest expenses incurred during the year minus the interest allowable, which you calculated from above. And that will be added back to our profit because we are disallowing it. Because we are disallowing it. This same concept is used for any foreign exchange loss. So again, the foreign exchange loss allowable. If it happens that our debt exceeds uh, the three times of the equity of the entity, then what is going to be happening is that our foreign exchange loss allowable, our foreign exchange loss allowable, shall be the debt allowable, which is going to be the three times of the equity of the company, divided by the total debt outstanding, times the foreign exchange loss. And that will give us the foreign exchange loss allowable for the year. The amount that is non-allowable, boom, we're going to add it back to the profit of the entity. But it doesn't end there. Yes, that is the thin capitalization concept. But then the whole tax implication of the entire transaction is that the entity shall charge a withholding tax of 8% on the interest payment on the interest payable to the foreign investor, okay? To the investor. So that is the concept of uh, thin capitalization if you ask and how it is applied. So it comes into the picture if the entity borrows money from a non-resident entity. And so before you determine whether you should allow all the interest expenses or foreign exchange or not to allow, we have to ask ourselves, what is the debt of the company at the beginning of the year? What is three times of the equity of the entity? You compare that. If the debt is less than three times the equity of the company, all interest, all foreign exchange laws shall be allowable for tax purposes. But if it happens that our debt outstanding at the beginning of the year exceeds three times the equity of the company, then what is going to be happening is that you need to do this workings or this calculation to arrive at the amount of interest that is going to be allowable for tax uh, purposes as well as foreign exchange that will be allowable for tax purposes. Then certainly, the whole tax implication of the deal is that uh, we need to charge 8% withholding tax. That is the resident entity making that payment charges 8% of, on the withholding, uh, as a withholding tax and remits that to the Ghana Revenue Authority. So, um, Eben, if you ask about the thin capitalization concept, uh, that is what you need to understand about that. Let me know if that makes sense for you. And that is the idea about the thin capitalization, the thin capitalization. Then uh, the second thing is treatment of financial cost and uh, financial gain. The treatment of financial cost and financial gain. Again, this is cutting across from both principles of taxation and then advanced uh, taxation as well. Now, the financial costs we are talking about here are financial costs incurred on derivative instruments. So we are not talking about debts. We are not talking about loan. Loan and debt, interest expenses, that is where thin capitalization may come in if the loan is from a non-resident investor. But if you are dealing with uh, financial instruments, the cost we incurred on financial instruments, like features, like hedging, money market hedge, and those things, uh, when the entity engages in that and incurs a cost or makes some gains, 
the way we tax it depends on the entity that we are dealing with. If the entity is uh, a traditional entity, now when we say a traditional entity, we mean an entity that is outside the oil and gas uh, sector, okay? Outside the oil and gas or the minerals sector. So the way we tax it makes it real in that particular case at the end of the day. Then, so if it comes to the traditional entities, the way we say is that the financial cost allowable for tax purposes, okay, the financial cost allowable for tax purposes shall be the financial gain plus 50% of adjusted chargeable income. The financial gain plus 50% of adjusted chargeable income. What does that mean? It means that before you determine how much financial cost that will be allowable for tax purposes, you must have the adjusted chargeable income. What is the adjusted chargeable income? The adjusted chargeable income simply means bringing the profit for the year of the entity as given in the question, add back the non-allowable uh, deductions like depreciation and those things. Then you're going to be getting your adjusted figure, then the financial cost was subtracted. So we will add back the financial cost. Whilst financial gain was deducted in arriving at this figure, so we will less any financial gain the entity had. And that figure there is the adjusted chargeable income. So it is that adjusted chargeable income that will we will take 50% of that plus any financial cost any financial gain that they get. And that is the traditional approach for treating financial cost and financial gain for traditional entities, that is entities outside the mining, minerals, oil exploration sectors. What does that mean? Any um, financial cost that is not allowable for tax purposes shall be carried over for five years. Okay, carry over for five years. So financial costs and financial financial costs are not allowable on a wholesale basis. They are not allowable on wholesale basis. They are capped. They are capped. Now, for traditional companies, in a year that they make a financial gain without incurring any financial cost, that financial gain shall be included in the accessible income of the entity and tax at the corporate tax rate. No problem, it goes straight up into it. It goes straight up into it. Now, if they incur financial cost without any financial gain, certainly because of the 50% rule, we will have an amount that has to be written off. So that is how we deal with financial cost and financial gain when we are dealing with traditional entities, entities outside the oil and gas or mineral operations. But the entities that are in the oil and gas, mineral operation situation, we use the matching principle at the end of the day. Now, what the heck is the matching principle? It means that we match the financial costs against the financial gain. In other words, when we are dealing with mining oil exploration situation, the financial cost allowable for a year of assessment shall be equivalent to the financial gain and during the year. Shall be equivalent to finance gain and during the year. It's the matching principle. It's the matching principle. What does that mean then? It means that when it comes to mining oil exploration companies, in a year where there is a financial cost, but no financial gain, what happens is that the financial cost is carried over, okay, for five years. It's carried over for five years. That's it. You carry it over. You don't, you don't allow anything. But the funny thing is that in a year where they make financial gain, but no financial cost, that one, we will add the gain, okay, we add the financial gain to their chargeable income and tax it at their corporate tax rate of 35%, because that is what mining oil exploration companies are going to be doing in that particular case. So that is also the issue about how we deal with financial cost and financial gain when it comes to uh, issues relating to um, 
traditional companies and then uh, non-traditional companies. Again, all these are included in your uh, principal documents because if you look at your principal documents, we explain the summary of this with all the pro forma that you need to understand and know about. And uh, you have your principal documents. And what I just explained, it's available as well in the principal documents that you can uh, go through and then look at at the end of the day when it comes to dealing with that. So that's about financial cost, financial gain. Okay, so I see some of you guys joining on YouTube as well. If there are any questions you have, we are looking at uh, principles of taxation and advanced taxation. So if there are any questions, you put it in the chat for me. Uh, I'm going to be providing you with some answers. And then for those of you on Zoom with me, uh, you can raise your hand and bring you up or you put it in the chat for me and I'm going to provide you with some answers as we look at. It's a Q&A. So the questions you ask is what I'm going to just focus on so that I don't uh, talk a lot throughout. Eben said, it makes sense, thanks, except some real figures would have been desirable. I know time won't permit that. Yeah, definitely, because we wouldn't be able to solve, solve questions here. Yes, James, your hand is up. Sir, so please, uh, there is uh, uh, thing capitalization. We, we, you, 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 met, you said the, the outstanding balance at the beginning, but we solved a question where we use the outstanding balance at the close of the end. I don't know what is what is the difference there. I don't understand your question. The 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 financial the, uh, the thing capital, uh, capitalization where the, the, the debt is understanding it's not a fresh one, but it has been brought down. And you have been given the, the opening balance and then the closing balance. We use the closing balance, we saw some question where we use the closing balance. Uh, so on assignment, but when you were talking, you said that it uh, should be charged at the uh, closing balance, uh, opening balance. If we have the debt uh, available at the beginning of the year or at the end of the year, uh, we are looking at the interest payment that is going to be outstanding. So if the interest payment was, if there were some payments made during the year on the loan notes, definitely, then we have to look at the loan notes that is outstanding at the end of the year so that we look at how much will be allowable for tax purposes. So if we are dealing with the interest payment for the year, then certainly, you, okay, then certainly you look at the amount that is outstanding at the uh, end of the year to look at your figure. So if you have the beginning and the end, which means uh, there has been some payments happening during the year, then certainly you would have to look at the figure outstanding at the, at the end of the year to find out how much will be allowable for tax purposes based on the thing capitalization concept. And uh, also when you, uh, when you were doing that, this in the financial gain and this thing, after, uh, after adjusting the, uh, the chargeable income, and then you you apply the fifty percent. What happened to the the this in the gain again? Are you going to add it back? Which gain? You know the financial gain. You know we said we we you know, when you were explaining we established that uh, uh, the financial gain shall be uh, financial cost shall be uh, fifty percent. Uh, 50 percent uh, of the adjustable uh, adjusted uh, uh, adjusted accessible income plus the the gain but when we want the adjusted uh, accessible income we may we we adjust it by deducting the uh, the capital uh, gain that they have included so i'm saying that after you have adjusted and you find your uh, Financial costs. What happened? How do you treat the financial gain again? Do you go and add it back, or since it has already been deducted, you won't do anything? Yes, you have to add back. You subtracted, you added back finance costs here and subtracted financial gain because you wanted your adjusted profit. So the workings you are doing here is to find out about your financial cost allowable for tax purposes. So after you find your financial cost allowable for tax purposes, what you're going to do is you, you take your adjusted profit and then you less that financial cost allowable for tax purposes that you had. Then you add back your finance gain for the year 
and that will give you the chargeable income that will be subject to tax. Thank you. Thank you. That's where I've, I'm okay. Thank you. Right. Okay. So that is it about uh, that also as well. Uh, let me see if I have any other questions coming in for me. If there are any other questions, you bring it up for me uh, because I'm not going to be talking about everything here, definitely, as you can see here. Uh, briefly, we mentioned that carryover of losses shall be three years, uh, but then if it is for priority sectors, then it shall be, what, five years. And some of these priority sectors include uh, manufacturing, uh, minerals or oil exploration, um, IT, waste processing, and all of those things we mentioned uh, about these. So if it is a priority sector, then certainly we would have to uh, uh, carry over the losses for a period of five years in that regard. If you remember also about the concept of capital allowance, we mentioned that the classes issues occur when we are dealing with principles of taxation, corporate company, default companies. So if you're dealing with default companies, normal manufacturing companies, then you're going to be dealing with the classes where we mentioned that from class one to class three assets, they lose their identity immediately. They are put into the pool. For that reason, uh, an addition during the year is just added to the pool. A disposal of an asset from the pool is subtracted from the pool at the end of the day. And so assets in class one to class three lose their identity. So addition, you just add it. If you dispose of anything, you subtract it from the pool at the end of the day. And also capital allowance is granted from cl for class one to class three assets on a reducing what? Balance basis on reducing balance basis. However, for class four and five assets, they don't lose their identities. What does that mean? It means that uh, if during the year, the entity acquires a new building, a new asset of permanent structure or something like that, it is going to be not added to the existing pool, but we create another thing. So it means that we're gonna be having maybe class five, a and then class five B because assets in four and five do not lose their identity. And capital allowance is also granted on these assets on what? A straight line basis. On straight line basis. Now, if you remember, we made mention of the fact that if the pool is disposed of and it happens that there is an excess consideration over the written down value there is an excess consideration over the written down value of the pool. That excess consideration over the written down value of the pool is added to the chargeable income of the company and tax at the corporate tax rate of the entity and tax at the corporate tax rate of the entity. So basically for default traditional manufacturing da -da 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 companies, that is the principles we must understand. And definitely there are some theories surrounding uh, capital allowance, if you check your principal documents, we shared some thoughts on uh, some of these things as well in your principal's document that you can look at conditions for granting capital allowance, uh, when the capital allowance can be granted and all that. We share that in the principal documents. You make sure you go through that as well. So that is the default companies, how we deal with capital allowance. Then please make sure you go over the classes of assets that are going to be in each of the uh, pool. I'm not going to be going through that, but certainly in your principal document, just want to see if I have it here because it should be in the principal document. Yep, this is capital allowance situation coming on here. Yeah, So you have to know what kind of assets that come in class one, class two, class three, so that you, are, you know how to what, do your classification. So for default companies, that is the rule you must understand. They don't lose their identity. Assets in one to three do not lose their identity. But assets in four and five, sorry, 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 sorry. Assets in one to three lose their identity. So any acquisition during the year, you add. Any disposal, you subtract. But assets in four and five do not lose their identity for the period under review. But if we come to mining and oil exploration, that is not a deal. For minerals, mining and oil exploration, advanced taxation situation, all 
expenditures are just put into a pool and we grant a capital allowance over five years on straight line basis, over five years on straight line basis, or at 20% straight line. That's all. So the pooling system, all those things, that, 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 that doesn't okay in that situation. Doesn't okay in that situation. For that reason, advanced taxation, we said that mining has uh, three uh, stages that it, it goes through. Uh, what is it? Is it reconnaissance, uh, exploration, and then development? Am I right? I don't know. Should be right. Then for uh, oil exploration, we're going to have exploration, uh, development, and then production. I think here should be production as well. Something like that. Now, we said that the cost incurred in mining, reconnaissance, and exploration stage in uh, uh, oil exploration, exploration, and development stage, all the costs incurred at these stages are capitalized or pulled into a pool. Okay? They are capitalized. Then when production begins, the entity will be granted a capital allowance at what I mentioned here, 20% straight line or over a period of five years or over a period of five years. So that is what you need to understand that as far as we are the uh, reconnaissance, we are now starting. As far as we are the development stage, nothing is going to happen. All costs we incur will just be put into a pool. Then when we start with production, we're going to get over five or at 20% as capital allowance granted. So that is also the distinction you must understand when it comes to treatment of capital allowance by default companies and treatment of capital allowance when it comes to dealing with mining, oil exploration companies as well. So that is the issue about that. Then there was a question about taxation of uh, other income by someone on YouTube. Let me see if I can get that question. Okay, Godwin in Tiamua also said um, taxation of other income. So let me share my thoughts on that uh, quickly. Well, now let me talk first about dividends, then we will jump into other income. We said that dividend taxation usually is based on the ownership that they individual has at the end of the day. So if the individual has an ownership below 25%, that means that dividend payment is going to be subject to a withholding tax of 8%. And so the entity paying the dividend is going to withhold 8% of the amounts that a person ha ha it's receiving. But then if the ownership is more than 25%, then what is going to be happening is that what is going to be happening is that um, there will be the dividend will be exempted from withholding taxes. Dividend will be exempted from withholding taxes. Now, this rule applies to traditional companies, default companies, normal companies. But companies in the minerals, mining, oil exploration situation, mm -mm. That one, and this is for advanced taxation students as well, that one, irrespective of your ownership, once dividend is paid, we're going to take our 8%. So irrespective of ownership here, irrespective of ownership, the dividend payment is going to be subject to, the dividend payment is subject to and 8% withholding tax. Simple. Simple. So the rule of 25% not and 25% is for normal companies. But if it is a mining and oil exploration companies, uh, I'm sorry, but irrespective of your ownership, we're going to tax that. In addition to that, there are other incomes that an entity will receive. And those other income, the rule that abides by it is that those other income shall be taxed at a 25% rate. Shall be taxed at a 25% rate. What does that mean then? 
It means that if, for instance, we have a company and we are told that they receive an interest, which is net uh, of whatever, let's say 10,800 they received, and uh, it was at a withholding tax of, after a withholding tax of 10%, This is the net amount the entity has received. Now, so that net amount the entity had received, they have added it to their profit in arriving at their profit figure. So how do we deal with it for tax purposes? Simple. We need to find a gross amount. We need to find the gross amount. So we ask ourselves, what is the gross amount? Very simple here. So the net amount is 10,000. Sorry, I'm writing dollars here. I forget that I have to put some respect on our Ghana cities. It's not the only currency falling in the world. All currencies are falling. Before you know it, you people are writing dollars in the exam hall. They come and blame me. So this is the net amount. So how do we get a gross amount? So to get a gross amount now, this is, this is representing 90%, all right? So the withholding tax that was charged will be 10 over 90 times this figure. Could pull it up real quick. 10 over 90 times 10,800. Oh, I'm getting 1,200. So that a gross amount, it's going to be 10,800, 12,000 CDs. So this is the gross amount. That is what we are interested in. So the entity added the net in arriving at their profit. We will deduct that. So you deduct the net from their profit. Then you instead add the gross because the gross must be taxed at what? 25%. Now, be careful here. Be careful here. Because you see, if you are dealing with corporate tax liabilities, you must understand that entities may have different tax rates. Yeah, if it is a default company, we would tax them at 25%. If the company is manufacturing company, will be located outside Accra, 18.75%. If the entity is located somewhere in the uh, our district capital somewhere, then it's going to be 12.5%. So you have to be mindful the organization in the question. If assuming it is a default company, tax at 25 percent then all we would do is that subtract the net go and add the gross that you calculated instead so that you tax everything at 25 percent then once you get the corporate tax liabilities of the entity you now come and subtract the withholding tax that was charged the 1200 so that you can get a tax what payable i hope that makes sense I hope that makes sense. So that is the issue. If the company is a 25 percenter, we charge the company as 25. But where it is a manufacturing company, it's a company located in some district capital somewhere or some location somewhere, then we may tax the company at 12.5 percent or 18.25 percent. In such cases, then you have to do two things. One, the net amount that was added to their profit, we will deduct it so that you get their chargeable income. Once you get your chargeable income, you're going to be taxing that at whatever uh, tax rate, maybe 18.75% or 12.25%. When you finish, then you come and deal with the other income separately. Then the other income, you bring in the gross amount from my illustration here, 12,000. Then you bring in the tax on that. That should be 25%. Uh, this divided by four, that would be 3,000 if my memory serves me right. 3,000. Then you come and less the withholding tax that was charged. That was withheld, which was the 1,200 from it. And that will give you the tax payable in respect of the other income. And that will be 1,800. I hope you're seeing the difference. So if the company has a 25% tax, like you don't, do, you don't do this part because it's 25%. So all you do is subtract the net at the gross. Then you tax everything as 25%. Then you less the amount that was withheld, you are done. But if the company is not a 25% tax, we don't tax them at 25%, then 
then you have to deal with their income exclusive of that other income by subtracting the net amounts that they had included. Then you tax it at whatever tax rate they have exclusive of the 25%. Once you are done with that, you come and deal with the other income separately in that case. Any questions, please? That is how you tax other income. If it is interest, whatever. Like I said, this is as per the directives, as per what we see the chief examiner uh, doing and the rules that they apply at the end of the day. So if it is interest on treasury bill, interest on fixed deposits, what are the income they have received? This is the rule that is going to be applying. It is going to be subject to a tax rate of 25%. And whatever amount that was withheld by the paying entity is going to be subtracted at the end of the day. This same thing happens to uh, foreign dividends if the entity receives foreign dividend. If they receive foreign dividends also, definitely it's supposed to be taxed at the 25% situation. So the gross amount we have to calculate it. Now, if the dividend came from a foreign country in which Ghana has a double taxation arrangement with, then we are going to be uh, subtracting the tax that was charged in the foreign country and we are going to get our total tax payable for the end of the year. And that is to the advanced taxation uh, students as well. So when it comes to taxation of other income, that's how you go about it. And uh, like I said, that was a question from YouTube from, uh, is it Godwin in Tiamor? And that, that is the answer to that uh, one there. Any other questions for me, please? Uh, you sure? Raise your hand, I bring you up. Is that? Raise your hand, I bring you up, or you put it in the chat for me on Zoom or on uh, YouTube. Okay, yes, Clement. So with, with regards to uh, uh, corporate tax uh, uh, computation, if you are giving maybe uh, a net uh, amount in the, in, the, in the question, are you supposed to calculate the chargeable income? Uh, are you supposed to calculate the chargeable income before you come and deduct the gross from the from the figure uh, in what context are you talking here like you are dealing with a company and they have other income coming in yeah like something like uh, net maybe net dividend or net income or net interest something like that yeah what we are saying here is that it is not an issue uh at the end of the day so what's going to be happening is that you can, it's the net amount you have to deduct and then bring in the gross amount. So whether you deduct it, because you have to deduct it before arriving at the chargeable income, and you have to do that adjustment before heading to chargeable income, because chargeable income is your final figure. So whether you deal with it in the beginning or at the top, or deal with it at the bottom, it depends on the way you want to deal with it. Does that make sense? But you must know that you need to deduct the net and then add back the gross amount. You must know that you need to deduct the net and add back the gross amount. So, so you are saying that from the beginning, you can deduct the net amount. Then later yes. on, you, you add the gross. The gross amount. That is, if the company is at 25% tax, if the tax rate of the company is 25%. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And please, uh, you made a statement that if it is dividend or other income, note that the co that concept is just applicable to other incomes coming in. Because if it is dividend, usually dividend will be subject to a final uh, withholding tax. So these are other income exclusive of dividends that are coming in. Yes, okay. James, your hand is up. With the same concept, does it apply to uh, the individual, the dividend, and the other income? Does it apply to what? Like individual, 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 no corporate entity, but person. Uh, other income when, in terms when, of what? When, like, when uh, an individual invests in an uh, in a, in an institution, 
and he received dividends. Interest, interest, interest payments to interest paid to individual or interest dividend. payment to the individuals are exempted from tax. They are not subject to tax. Whether so whether, whether, from tax. whether whether domestic or foreign. In Ghana, it is exempted from tax. If it is foreign, then you the double taxation rule may come in or they have to add their gross amount. But resident financial institutions that pay interest on whatever deposits or whatever investment is exempted from tax. Both, both the interest and the income, uh, the dividend. Dividend is final withholding tax. So if it's an individual... It's final withholding tax. They don't have to add it to their income again uh, at the end of the day. Their dividend will be taxed. Dividend is different from interest. Dividend ownership is based on the rule we have established, 25% or less. So if you are a shareholder in MTN and you have some 20,000 CDs there, whatever, it's not up to 25% certainly. So when MTN is paying you dividend, they will deduct 25, uh, 8% from the money. That is a final withholding tax. But if you have a deposit in the bank and the bank pays you interest, that is exempted from tax. Interest paid by resident entities, resident <laughs> financial institutions is exempted from tax. Okay, thank you. So that is the difference between the two. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other questions for me, please? Any other questions for me? Uh, let me see. Got some chats coming in here. Chioma Okori said, good evening, uh, Inshira. Good evening, Chioma. Thanks for joining us. Eric Anku said, hi, Inshira. Kindly go highlight on transfer pricing. Please, can this be used to read for... No, 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 please, please. Chioma, please. Taxation in Nigeria is different from taxation in Ghana. So the rules are different. So please don't commit to that blender. Uh, definitely the, the, the laws will be different for these items. So please. Please, I've been searching for your video on learning curve. I don't think we've covered anything on learning curve in management accounting, unfortunately, on that. Paul M. Larry said business combination. What do you mean by business combination? I don't understand that. Oh, let me know. Okay, let me go back and let me see some of the questions, statements I had in the beginning. Okay, mergers, arrangements. Let me talk about that quickly. Uh, we mentioned that when there is mergers, transfer of ownership, or uh, amalgamation, whatever the heck, the taxation... And the tax implication of that depends on the continuing ownership in the business. Okay? Continuing ownership in the underlying assets of the new business, of the new entity. Now, this is strictly advanced taxation situation. So principal people, close your ears on that. So the way we tax uh, mergers, transfer of ownership, amal amalgamation and all that depends on what? The continuing ownership in the new business, in the new business. What we mentioned was that if the continuing ownership is uh, less than 50%, less than 50%, the transaction is considered as realized or disposed, okay? The transaction is considered as realized, is considered as realized or disposed. As such, any gain shall be subject to tax, okay? Any gain is subject to tax usually at a corporate tax rate, 25% generally. Then what happens is that that new business that has been formed, if the other entity is having any unrelieved losses, carryover, uh, uh, um, capital allowance and all that, the new business cannot benefit from those things because your continuing interest 
is less than 50%. But if the continuing interest is greater than 50%, boom, it is not a disposal. It is not a disposal. For that reason, any gain on that particular transaction may, is not subject to tax. Okay? It's not subject to tax. But in that regard, or in that case, what is going to happen is that the entity that is having more than 50% ownership interest, if they have on relief losses, carryover of uh, uh, finance costs from the previous year and all that, the new business can benefit from those things. So when it comes to amalgamation, transfer of ownership, mergers, that is the general rule that we need to understand. The rule depends on the continuing interest in the new business. And if it is more than 50%, it's not disposal. If it is less than 50%, boy, you just sold your business. So we're going to subject you to some tax at the end of the day. So that is the issue about the mergers uh, arrangement there that we got a question on coming in. So I've spoken about the mergers. I've spoken about thin capitalization. I'm talking about uh, the other income. Then uh, somebody spoke about mineral tax. I think I've spoken about that uh, as well. Taxation of mining companies. And then uh, someone also asked about areas of focus in relation to what subjects was that? That was Richmond uh, on advanced taxation. If there are any questions, you raise your hand, I bring you up or you put it in the chat for me. For those of you joining me on Zoom. So I'm going to run you down uh, quickly. Now, before I go into that, um, principles of taxation students also, uh, we're going to have, and, and this is also applicable to advanced taxation because the examiner can ask you, we're going to have income tax liabilities of individuals, individuals and uh, partnership. So the rules are very important. You need to understand uh, the various things that we need to look out for there. Um, over time, how it's treated, bonus, how it's treated, issues relating to um, borrowing or lending, to the employee, the rules governing that, you want to make sure you understand that. Uh, payments to uh, temporary staffs, how it's going to be taxed uh, generally. Now, over time, usually depends on whether the person is a junior staff or a senior staff. If the person is a junior staff, the overtime is first taxed at um is it 50% and then anything uh, above 50% of the basic salary is taxed at 10%. Up to 50% of the basic salary of the individual is taxed at 5%. Any amount in excess of that is taxed at 10% uh, in that case. But if the person is a senior staff, no overtime payments shall be allowable. So if they pay overtime to the person, we will just add it to the uh, chargeable income of the person or accessible income of the person and then use the individual graduated tax rates to apply the tax on it in that regard. Now, we made a distinction between a junior staff and a senior staff. We said uh, somebody can be a junior staff when the person's salary is $1,500 a month, or uh, that figure times 12 is what? Is it 18000 I guess? Yeah, 18000 an annum per year. So if the person is getting salaries, 1,005 CDs a month, 18,000 a year, we consider the person as a junior staff. But be careful. If the person holds a senior position, but takes a salary that looks like a junior staff, then the person is still a senior. So no overtime payment shall be applied to that person. No overtime payment shall be applied to that person. Then if, the, if, if someone is also a junior staff and holding a senior position. So the person is taking a salary of about 1,500 a month, but holding a senior position, then even though by the salary, the person is a junior staff, by the position of the person, 
the person is a senior staff, so hence shall not be subject to the payment of tax. And that is very important there in that case. And all these rules are in your principal's documents. Let me just uh, show you that in your principal document here. There we go. There we go. So that's the overtime rule. Make sure you go over them, understand them. They can be direct five marks, three marks, two marks questions the examiner will throw at you that you must understand. Then bonuses. Bonuses. Bonuses, what is going to be happening is that bonuses up to 15% uh, of the annual basic salary of the person is taxed at uh, 5%. Any amount in excess of that, it will be added to the accessible income. And that is how we tax bonuses as well. Then the issue relating to payments or benefits to employees. If the benefit to the employees is non-discriminatory, meaning everybody gets some, then it, should, it shall not be included in the chargeable income or accessible income of the employee. But if it is a discriminatory incentive or payment, then we will include it in the chargeable income of the person in question. So the taxation of other forms of payments apart from overtime and bonus depends on whether it is discriminatory or non-discriminatory. Then certainly casual staffs, we're going to be uh, taxing them generally at uh, a 5% final withholding tax. But most importantly, temporary workers, they are going to be taxed at the individual graduated tax rate. So there's a difference between casual workers and temporary workers. And so if the temporary workers, we will tax them as though they are normal individuals at the individual graduated tax rate. But the casual workers will be taxed at a 5% uh, final withholding tax. I mean, they are casual. They are not going to file their tax anywhere again. So we leave them in that regard. But where there is loan to employees, we mentioned the condition. The loan payment exceeds 12 months. Definitely, the loan is not more than uh, the person's three months salary at the end of the year. Uh, sorry, exceeds three months salary at the end of the year. And certainly, the loan is from the employer to the employee. Now, what happens is that some companies uh, give loan to their employees below the borrowing rate. So if the Bank of Ghana is lending at 18%, uh, they will give the loan to their employees at 5%. It's a way to motivate the employees. Now, the tax authority does not let things like that go away. You have benefited, so we have to tax it. So the loan benefits that have to be included in the accessible income will be one-fourth of the loan benefit you got. And the loan benefit is the difference between the interest you pay at the statutory rate minus the interest you pay to your employer. The difference between that is the loan benefit. So we take one fourth of that and that will be the loan benefit to be included in the accessible income of the individual, in the accessible income of the individual. So you make sure that these principles, you understand them very well when you're dealing with taxation of individuals. Then note that gifts individual receive in employment shall be added to the accessible income and tax at the individual graduated tax rate. Gifts received by individual in employment shall be added to their uh, accessible income and tax at the individual graduated tax rate. However, the issue relating to gift tax and capital gain tax is different. So if we receive gifts, then certainly the gifts will be subject to a tax of 15%. Subject. But we mentioned that gift from close relatives, gift uh, from spouses, uh, gift from as, as part of a divorce settlement and those things like I'm broken hearted and my wife is giving me some money. Uh, yeah, you don't come and tax that money. You don't tax that. And if you remember, we solved a question in class, wedding situation, and uh, you saw how we do, the, we do the treatment with that. So apart from employment gift, which will be included in the accessible income, any gift an individual receive, which is not from a close relative, shall be subject to a tax of what? 15%. The same thing to, happens to capital gains tax. If an individual sells capital assets and there is a gain on the capital assets, that gain shall be subject to a withholding tax of 
15%. Now, that gain, the capital gains we are talking about here is the proceeds the person had less the cost base of the assets. Cost base of the asset. Now, the cost base of the asset is the original purchases cost. The cost base of the asset is the original purchases cost plus all other costs incurred in making the assets ready for sale. But there was something we mentioned exclusively about the cost base of the assets. That, for instance, if there was a cost incurred, that cannot be seen at the date of the disposal. That shall not be included in the cost base of the asset. What the heck is that? Let's say I buy a land and I bought the land for, say, whatever, 100,000 CDs. Then the place was a marshy area. So I tried to uh, maybe put some concrete on the floor and all that, spending some 10K on that, 10,000 CDs. Then I said, oh, this area, land guards are worrying a lot. So I raised some one bedroom, uh, maybe just one room there, spending maybe 12,000 CDs on that. But then the land guards came and demolished that. They came to demolish it. Then I'm like, ah, I'm no longer interested in this community because I have, a, I have another land. And that is after two years. Then I now sell the land for whatever, let's say $150,000. Did I say dollars again? 150,000 CDs. What we are saying here is that if I'm determining the cost base of my assets, even though I spent 12,000 building a structure on the land, that structure is not there when I am selling it or was not there when I, 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 I decided to sell. For that reason, that 12000 shall not be included in the cost base of my assets. So it means the cost base of my assets will be the original cost, the 100000 and then the uh, concrete I did because the place was a marshy area. So in total, that's going to be 110000 cities so that my gains, capital gains is going to be what? 40,000 Ghana cities. That is what we mean by the capital gain tax situation. I hope that makes sense. So the cost base, any cost we incur, advertisement cost, agency cost, value cost, all that will be included. But if there was a structure we constructed, but the structure was demolished, then what is going to be happening is that that shall not be included in the cost base of our assets. But this is a sweet spot, and this is where wealth is built. We can dodge this tax. How do we dodge it? Because the tax code gives us a way to dodge it, so we will dodge it always. And it is called the rollover relief. It's called a rollover relief. So rollover relief may be granted if all the proceeds or a portion of the proceeds is used to acquire another asset, then we get a rollover relief. Then we get a rollover relief. In that case, not all the gains will be subject to tax. So let me build up. So I sell my asset for whatever. Let's say I sell my asset for um, $150,000. That's okay. And I buy a new land somewhere. Maybe let's say uh, I was cheap a little bit. So I buy a new land somewhere and the land was $120,000. So that is now the cost base of that land that I bought at the end of the day. So we're going to be looking at the new asset I bought. Okay, the new asset I bought. Compare with the cost of the other assets I bought. Uh, sorry, the cost of the other asset I sold previously. So we less cost base. So this is the new asset or what we call the replacement asset, the cost of the replacement asset. Then I less the cost of the original asset, and that's 110,000. So it means that I will get a rollover relief of 10,000. Remember, I had a capital gain from here of 40,000. So now I get a rollover relief of 10,000. So now my capital gains that will be subject to tax will be what? 30,000. So now I get to pay capital gains tax at 15% on 
on the 30,000 and not on the 40,000. That is the concept of rollover relief. Now, assuming I used all the money to buy another asset, or even I, I add more money and bought another asset that is overvalued, I may not pay any tax at all at the end of the day. So assuming I sold this asset for 150000 and I bought another land for 150000 definitely I will get a rollover relief of 40000 and that is equal to the capital gains of 40000 So I will not pay any tax. The idea here is that you are rolling over the tax payable to the future. So it's called deferred tax effect. You are rolling it over to the future. And that is where wealth is built. That's where wealth is built. So that is the concept also about the capital gain tax that you must understand. Principles of taxation students, one of these guys will be in the exam hall. Either gift tax, capital gain tax, or the two of them will be there because we have had two exams died where the two of them were in town and the examiner was 10, five, five marks on them making 10. So that is a rule governing gift tax and capital gains tax. But there are conditions surrounding gift tax and capital gain tax. You can read over those theories in your book and uh, you should be good in that regard when it comes to dealing with chargeable gains, that is gift tax and then capital gains tax. Any other questions for me? Clement, is your hand up or is the old one? I don't know. Um, James, is your hand up or is the old yeah, one? Yes, yeah, sir. So in the explanation, it's like uh, uh, something escaped me. You said that a gift from uh, employment is added to your chargeable income. Yeah. Um, but the uh, uh, standard gift uh, tax at uh, 15%. If you receive, if you are an employee and your customers give you a gift or present you a gift, that gift will be, we determine the fair value of the gift and that will be added in the determination of your accessible income and tax at the individual graduated tax rate. But if you are having your wedding and people come to give you gifts, that one, it will be taxed at 15%. And that was the gift that I said, the government should rather go for gift tax and drop the e-levy instead. Okay, people are doing their wedding, uh, naming ceremony, funeral, and all those things. We go there, tax force, then all the gifts that are not coming because the family members, 99.9% .9 of the time, they don't, they, don't, they don't bring any gift on board. So it's all about other people. Then we will tax that. So that is the concept there, okay? From employment, we add it to the employment income. But then uh, other gift you receive is going to be uh, taxed at 15%. So maybe on my birthday, you buy me uh, whatever. By my birthday, I for 14 will not be out, but maybe you buy me something, then I'll just determine the fair value. I'll go and file gift tax returns on it. Then I'll go and pay the 15% to the to the GRE. Does that make sense for you on that? Um James? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I don't know whether sir. I will come back later. Okay. Um any other questions, please? Uh, Clement said, any brief explanation on anything relating to VAT and withholding tax? VAT is a broad area. What, what, what should I talk about on VAT? That's a huge area. What the heck can I say there? We mentioned that uh, the scope of VAT now is uh, we bring in the value of the products, right? We bring in the value of the products. Generally, uh, Ghana City respected. Then you bring in your national health insurance levy situation, 2.5% of the value of the product, value of product. Uh, we bring in get fund. All these things have been collateralized allegedly. Also, 2.5%. Uh, then now the famous COVID-19 recovery levy. Hoping that my video will not be censored. COVID-19 recovery levy, that's 1% of also the value of the product. So you're going to be adding all these guys up. And that gives you the gross amount exclusive of uh, VAT. Then you can now apply your VAT. 
at the 12 age 12.5 not 12 percent at 12.5 percent okay and that gives you uh your vat invoice for the period under review now this is if we are in the standard vat system okay so we have the standard vat system then there are some businesses that are not well structured so they will go for the um flat rate system now the flat rate system previously it was three percent but now it's also four percent because of the COVID 19 uh situation coming in at the end of the day so what happens is that that one also we bring in the value of the product the same scenario then we have our COVID uh recovery levy don't know what these all these levies are doing in this country then we bring in the VAT situation coming up, 3%. So this is 1%. This is 3%. And then we get a VAT invoice. Okay. And usually this is, we, like we said, is for wholesalers, uh, retailers. I mean, who don't have complex system in place to have the standard rates coming in at the end of the day uh, in that case. So that is the issue about uh the competition aspect of that but certainly we mentioned that there are various types of tax supply that we need to look out for uh we have the taxable supply um what else we got there exam supply um we also have whatever i think relief supply and uh what else we got Taxable supply, exam supply, relief supply. What the heck do we got? Zero rated supply. Zero rated supply. And I think mixed supply as well. Now, taxable supply are any supply that are taxed at a standard rate of 12.5% period. So a supply is taxable when the supply is undertaken by a taxable individual. So any supply that is undertaken by a taxable individual shall be taxed definitely at 12.5%. Uh, uh, exam supply are uh, supplies that are also outside the scope of tax. So they are exempted from tax at the end of the day. So effectively they have a tax rate of zero, but they are exempted. So like for instance, um, issues relating to uh, certain products to physically challenge uh people they are uh things they use uh, they are exempted some education material exempted from vat medical equipment and all those things exempted from vat and you know these things they are in your book you make sure you go through them relief supply are uh, supplies that are taxable though but the status of the person makes them to become uh, also not subject to tax, like the Commonwealth uh, missionaries, but there has to be a reciprocal benefits that Ghana receives from that country. At the end of the day, it will be referred to as a relief uh, supply. Then also the concepts relating to some non-governmental organization. This is where the VRPO uh, comes in, the VAT uh, relief purchase uh order the document that is issued to cover the vat component of the sales comes in there zero rated supply are supply that are subject to tax but at a rate of what zero percent they are subject to tax but at a rate of zero percent the mixed supply are any supply that have both taxable supply and then uh relief supply or makes a uh, exam supply in them at the end of the day. So these are the types of supply that you need to also understand when we talk about that. Um, the issue is that there are other theories in VATS. Like I said, it's a broad area, like um, conditions for registering for VATS. We have the statutory registration, the optional registration. Uh, you make sure you read through that. And then uh, benefits of registering for VATS, that's also a written area or a reading area that you can go through as you uh prepare for the issues in relation to that but most importantly most importantly will be the way withholding tax is and how it also relates to that so if you go to your principles documents we covered that pretty well let's see if i have that here 
you know, principal documents. Now, I, I spoke about individuals, but I didn't spoke about the, I didn't talk about, sorry, the benefits they have, but I hope you know this already. Uh, marriage, a maximum of one. If the person has married three, we don't care. Maximum of one. Thousand two a year. Disability, you get, you get a lot of money. 25% of the total accessible income. Boom. We give it to you. Education, three. But the student, sorry, the children must be in a, a, in a school recognized by Ghana Education Service. So if the person has taken his children outside of Ghana, Ghana Education Service is not there. So you will not get education allowance. And by the way, if you can take your child to school outside, what the heck is 1,800 Ghana cities doing? Because 1,800 Ghana cities, that's more or less like maybe some... To two two hundred dollars or something like that. In that case, now that the Ghana city is misbehaving, then cost of training, um, old age. That is, if the person taxable person is older, the person enjoys that. Then certainly your contribution to the SNIT. Uh, then issues about provident fund is also going to be uh subject or allowable for a relief. Then contribution to worthwhile costs. Now. It may not be clear whether the donation is to where. Now, this applies to both companies and individuals. So if you see donation in the question, you have to justify it. Whatever assumption you use, please write it down. I think I've told you this in the various classes for principles of tax and advanced taxation. Whatever assumption you use in your workings, in your calculation, please state it down to the examiner. Why do you think it's a worthy cost? If you write it down, it's reasonable. It may be marked. But if you don't write anything and you just treat it however you like it, you may be punished by the examiner. So certainly those things must be understood. Let me go back to my VAT. I was just referring you to that. Yeah, so this is the concept about VAT coming in at the end of the day. Um, what I just discussed with you, the standard rated situation. Uh, so we have that coming in there. In that regard, then the concept about withholding taxes, it's also here. Goods, works, or services are going to be subject to a withholding tax once the thing exceeds 2,000 Ghana cities. And they are withholding tax on account. And we distinguish between withholding tax on account and then final withholding tax. On account and final withholding tax. We said if it is a final withholding tax, the taxpayer shall not add or include it in their accessible income. They shall not add or include in their accessible income. But if it is on account, then the gross amount shall be included. And then when we determine the tax liability, we less. Uh, when we determine the tax liability, then we less the withholding tax or tax that has been withheld when the payment was made by the company making the payments. So that is the difference between withholding tax on accounts and then final withholding tax. But the goods, works, or services, remember the rates 3, 5, and 7.5%. Now, the 2,000 CDs is for the same year of assessment. So if the first sales you make, I'm seeing a question coming up from here. Let me check. If the, uh, if let's say that the person in the first time, the person in the first time uh, did a payment and that payment is uh, maybe 800. Okay, 800 is below 1,000, so not subject to VAT. But the second time, the person did another 800. Mm. It's still below 2,000, so again, not subject to VAT. Now, you have to look at the cumulative. Cumulative is 1,006. Oh, it's still below 2,000, so not subject to VAT. Sounds good? But if the person did another one, in the same year of assessment, the person did another 800. Like the person is doing thoughts, thoughts. Now, that 800 will also not be subject to tax. But here, you have to deal with the cumulative. So in the same year of assessment, cumulative is now 2,400. Oh, 
it has now exceeded the 2000. So that would be tax at whatever. 3% if it is goods, 7.5% if it is services, and then, uh, sorry, 7.5% if it is services, and then 5% if it is works at the end of the day. So that is the issue we must understand when it comes to dealing with that particular one as well. So um, about VAT and withholding tax, these are the things that I'll share my thought on uh, in that regard about how they go in there. And that was uh, a question from Clement uh, in that case. I hope that makes sense. Let's see, do we have, saw a question coming up Is that on YouTube also? Okay, now on Zoom, Isaac said, please share your thoughts on what's contract for service and contract of service. Okay contract of service and contract for service uh it's pretty simple when we say of service and for service of service means an employer employee relationship an employer employee relationship that is contract of service Okay, it's an employer employee relationship. But then, contract for service, it's uh, more or less like a client contractor relationship. Sounds good? Client or contractor relationship. So, this is an employer employee relationship. Employer employee relationship in that particular case. And uh, the way we distinguish between this is uh, who bears the risk? Who provides the inputs for the work? Okay, so who bears the risk? If it is the employer bearing the risk, then it is a contract of service. But if it is the employee who bears the risk, then it will be a contract of service. If the input is provided, the, the tools needed for the work is provided by the employer, then it is a contract of service. If the tools provided, if the things needed is provided by not the employer, then it will be a contract for service. So if you ask about the distinction or my thoughts on contract for service and contract of service, that is the idea about that. And certainly if you are in contract of service, you enjoy some statutory benefits at the end of the day. I mean, they have to pay the, your SNIT for you first year, second year in those situations. But if it is contract of service, sorry, contract for service, you are your own boss. You, if you do your SNIT if you like, do your pension if you like, if you don't like, I mean, nobody cares about that at the end of the day. So that is the distinction between contract of so off means you are an employee. For means you are your own boss. So we need, we, we contract you for your service. We contract you for your service. So you are a boss on your own. But off means we need your service in our company. Come work for us. You'll be on a payroll, temporary or permanent in that regard. So that is the issue also about this one. Please give me a moment.
Okay, so if there are no other questions, let me do a quick rapid fire on uh, the two subjects and then uh, we can call it uh, a day to leave you to go and rest a little bit, gather some strength and uh, go in for tomorrow in the exams. So um, in a nutshell, for principles of taxation, we have mentioned various things to you already. Like I said a moment ago and explained, there's definitely going to be something on gift tax and then capital gains tax. One of them will be there or the two will be there. So make sure you understand the calculation, especially when it comes to capital gain tax, the concept of rollover relief, be mindful of that very well. And then the gift tax, what should be included, what should not be included, and the theories relating to that. We know there will be definitely uh, income tax liabilities of individuals and partnership. Whatever the examiner brings, know how to do the treatment, know how to deal with allowable or non-allowable. It could be a self-employed person or that is a contract for service or a contract for person where the person is an employee. Whatever be the case that examiner throws at you, you should be able to uh, do the treatment. But most importantly, if you are dealing with partnerships, you have to be careful because for partners of a partnership business, the partnership business is not subject to tax. It is the partners who are going to be subject to tax. So if you are dealing with partners of a partnership business, any salary, any benefits they receive, as part of the partnership business shall be dealt with as distribution of profit. For that reason, we will include it in their individual accessible income. So if any partner, we don't care if it is active or, uh, um, how do we call it? Active or dormant partner, whatever salary, whatever interest, whatever benefits they receive shall be included in the determination of their accessible income. So be mindful of, partnership, and then how they are dealt with. Certainly, the individuals are going to be enjoying their social, uh, their personal reliefs. If they are married, they will enjoy that. If they have children, they will enjoy that. If they are aged or old age, they will enjoy that. I mean, all the benefits available for an employee, they will enjoy if they, it is stated in the question that they qualify for it. Let me state this that if you are dealing with someone who is a contract of service, meaning an employee of the organization, whether the examiner says it or not, you must know the person must do must make a contribution, 5.5%. So that relief is automatic. So even if the examiner doesn't say that, oh, the person contributes to social security, as far as the person is an employee of a company and not above the pension age, and not above the pension age, then the person shall contribute because it's mandatory. It's mandatory. But if the person is above the pension age, please, thou shall not make any contribution into the fund. Because I mean, who the heck are you doing it for anyway? You're already on pension. Go sleep and continue your work for Mother Ghana. So give tax, capital gains tax, income tax of individuals and partnership, then corporate tax liabilities. I've shared my thought. Uh, on the issues there at the beginning of our discussion. Know how to deal with donations, allowable expenses, non-allowable expenses, financial costs, financial gain, thin capitalization, taxation of other income, carryover of losses, financial cost, financial gain. Uh, know how to deal with these issues. Know how to deal with these issues very well because they are going to be uh, basic. But then most importantly, along with work, uh, corporate tax is the capital gain capital allowance, either it will be a dedicated question on its own or the examiner will not even cough about it in the exam. So he may not cough about capital allowance. He'll give it to you directly. You'll pick it and you are like, oh, examiner, thank you very much. Other times he will give you information for you to calculate or you will have a dedicated 20, uh, 10 mark question on capital allowance that you would have to work for. Whatever be the case, remember the rules we established. Asset from class one to class three, lose the identity. Capital allowance is on reducing balance basis. Asset in class four and five, do not lose the identity. And so they are independent on their own and capital allowance is granted uh, on a straight line basis at 
either 10% of them or over a period of 10 years, depending on what we are looking out for. So that is corporate tax liabilities. We have to look out for that. Then certainly VAT and the concept of withholding tax, I mean, it's going to be there. Something about these guys will be there in the exam hall. So you make sure you know how to deal with the calculation aspect of these two things. And most importantly, also the theory aspect of these two topics, because definitely they are going to be there. Make sure you understand the principles that underline the computations and that underline the concept of withholding tax as well. Then we know that the examiner is going to be there. So these are like the la creme de la creme calculation situation aspect then once we are done with these the reading aspects are going to be coming in administration of tax in ghana that's a broad area but there is going to be some questions coming in from there assessment of taxes self-assessment uh provisional assessment the distinction between the two and all that uh uh governing structure of the ghana revenue authority the role of taxation in the economy then the concept of fiscal policy the examiner may throw five, 10 mark question on you. The concept of fiscal policy, why should government tax instead of going for a loan? Why should government go for a loan instead of tax? What is the implication of tax on their consumption, on uh, businesses? All these things are under fiscal policy. The examiner may share some five, 10 mark question on that. You want to make sure you scan read that again before heading to the exam hall. Then certainly the last part is going to be the pension, the three-tier pension scheme of Ghana. Over the last five examination diets, every semester there is something the examiner brings about that. We discuss the various issues about the defined benefits uh, and then the defined uh, contribution scheme the three-tier system, the mechanism, how it works, the first tier, the second tier, the third tier, the role of the national uh, pension regulatory uh, authority, and the objective of the uh, authority and all that, make sure you scan read that. It, it will not take you any time. Make sure you scan read that as well, very well. So when it comes to uh, principles of taxation, usually this is what we're gonna be having. Every topic in the exam or in the syllabus, there will be something about it. But the key takeaway here is knowing and remembering the rules the principles that underline each of these things that we have mentioned. Like I said, capital gain tax, know what should in be included in the cost base of the asset and what should not be included. Know how the concept of rollover relief is treated. Gift tax, know what should be subject to gift tax, what would not be subject to give gift tax. If you're dealing with corporate tax liabilities, know how to deal with donations. Know how to deal with, uh, with uh, other incomes. Know how to deal with issues relating to um, uh, financial cost, financial gain, and all that. So all these, it is going to be there, but it is not about it's going to be there. It's about knowing how to treat the items that will be given to you as per the tax laws governing all of these things uh, at the end of the day. So that is the issue about principles of taxation and the scope of the exams that we're going to be going in for. Like I say always, you want to make sure that you take away the theories uh, to save some time because you're going to be having a couple of written questions coming in in principles of taxation. VAT, there are theories there. Withholding tax, there are theories there. Certainly tax administration, there are theories there. Fiscal policy is purely theory. The pension scheme is theory uh, there. Gift tax, capital gain tax, there is theories there. Even corporate tax, there is theory there. So whatever theory the examiner brings to you, answer that first. Let that be your first call of action and answer that first uh, before you get yourself excited into any of the calculations in that regard. Um, taxation principles of tax calculations are not going to be bulky, uh, but the issue, when I say bulky, I mean they are not going to be technical, but uh, you just have to understand when you read a question, how you interpret the question that you have read, how you interpret the notes that has been given, and most importantly, write out the notes, briefing notes, explaining the treatment of all the items. Not all, but majority of the items. The ones that has two treatments in your head. You are like, oh, should I do it this way? Should I do it that way? Whichever way you go for, write it down to the for the examiner. If you write it down and it is reasonable, it is within the law, it's acceptable by the Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority, what's up? We give you a thumbs up and we clap for you and you get your marks at the end of the day. So please justify your workings in that particular case. So principles of taxation, 
That is what you need to understand. And the key issue that, again, you need to make sure you prepare yourself for before 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Then advanced taxation, we've shared our thoughts also on the various things that you need to be on the lookout for. Uh, we've mentioned the fundamental principles of corporate tax liability, just like what I mentioned uh, in the principles of taxation class. It's the same concept, it's the same rule, it's the same principle that is going to be applying here. So you want to make sure you pay attention to that. Then tax implications of transactions. We have gone through a lot of them. Tax implication, in an investor coming into Ghana, should a person go into a permanent establishment or establish an, a resident entity, an independent resident entity? How do we tax that? Make sure you understand that. Um, there is transfer of assets. How do we deal with that? There is mergers and acquisitions. How do we deal with that? Uh, somebody is thinking about investing in a free zone as compared to manufacturing companies. What, what, like, what is the tax implication of that? Uh, so a university, what is the tax implication on their profits? So tax implication is going to be carrying a lot of weight in the exam hall and all the individual principles we went through, you want to make sure you scan read those things before 2 p.m. Uh, tomorrow as you go into the exam hall because something is going to be up for grab when it comes to dealing with tax implication. So you have to make sure you pay attention to those uh, very well. Then certainly we're going to be having questions coming in relating to minerals or petroleum. Either one of them or the two will be in the exam hall. But you know the rules are kind of uh, a bit related when it comes to dealing with these items. Note, for the purpose of calculation, royalties will be 5%. As always, royalties, if you are dealing with minerals, it's going to be 5% of the ounces of gold or the production that we had. If you are dealing with petroleum, it's going to be 5% of the uh, barrels of oil that is produced. But in case we are not giving the things in ounces or barrels, then we are going to be getting revenue from the operations of, sorry, revenue from the sale of production. Now, the reason I just emphasize on revenue from sale of production is that sometimes the examiner will give us total revenue and that total revenue includes uh, revenue from the disposal of some assets that they have had. Then you don't do the 5% on your total revenue. You have to subtract the disposal of asset figure and get the amount of revenue from the sale of production. Then you do your 5% on that. But also take notes that we mention the various revenues that is available to the government when it comes to dealing with mining and oil exploration it is in your principal document you want to make sure that you scan read those uh, things very well uh, because you make sure you scan read those things very well because the examiner may uh, ask you some questions about them that I need to pay attention to. Remember, when it comes to mining and oil exploration, taxation of uh, financial cost and financial gain is going to be different. Uh, their tax rate is 35%. We know that already. And then dividend payments by them is also going to be taxed differently because it will be taxed at 8%, no matter the ownership that we have in them. So in addition to this, also capital allowance in mining and oil exploration is at 20% straight line or over a period of five years because all expenditure will just be put into the pool and then we grant a capital allowance of 5%. Now, remember, if they already have a written down value brought forward that had been granted a capital allowance over two years, that means the figure there will now be divided over three. So be careful about that. Then during the year, if they incur any expenditure during the year, that expenditure will grant capital allowance over a period of five years. So any expenditure they incur, capital expenditure they incur during the year, we will grant a capital allowance over five years. But any written down value brought forward and they say, oh, they have taken capital allowance for two years already, that means we will be left with three years. So whatever figure you are given divided by three becomes the capital allowance granted uh, for the year. So that is the issue about mining and oil exploration that you need to pay attention to and then uh, know about 
basically. Then certainly your tax planning measures, uh, the principles on the tax planning measures, we've, uh, uh, you need to make sure that you understand them and then go over them very well at the end of the day because they are going to be basic, they are going to be uh, important for you. Uh, in that regard. So make sure you understand the anti-avoidance principles as well, the concept of income splitting, the concept of transfer pricing, uh, the concept uh, relating to uh, the judiciary issues, all of those things, make sure you understand them. Then double taxation. Make sure you run through that again because the examiner could throw some questions uh, at you there. In a nutshell, for advanced taxation, the way you answer your question is very important. Like I said, if the examiner says, what is the tax implication of the thing? You make sure that your introduction comes. You talk about the tax provision. What does the law says? You contextualize the issue that has been raised. Then you bring up your conclusion uh, at the end of the day. So professional presentation is going to be very basic here. And your advanced taxation paper is largely going to be uh, uh, a written paper. Uh, depending on how excited the examiner is, we could have 40% calculation and 60% uh, written or comment area, or it could be 50-50, or it could be 80-20, uh, where you're writing English song. And so you have to be careful with your grammar, with your spellings, with your handwriting and all that. And uh, you should be good at the end of the day. So when it comes to advanced taxation also, these are the issues that we need to be mindful of. The tax implication of the various things that uh, we have gone over or we have gone through, make sure you go through them again to build your knowledge very well under that. Then uh, corporate tax liabilities, mining and oil exploration, the revenue that government gets, you get all of that in your principal uh, document, explaining them in detail, you make sure you understand them very well. So these are, uh, the issues here. Also here, you start with the theories first because that puts you in a spot so that you will be able to uh, write as much as you can write before you come to the calculation aspect because the calculation will require some time, will require some assumptions, will require some thinking. Because of that, advice, uh, I will advise that you look at the written aspect, both in principles of taxation and also uh, in advanced uh, taxation. So that is it about that, uh, basically, in relation to uh, what I want to share with you and uh, the questions that you brought up and things that we discussed. So that's it. Uh, I'm going to be concluding around here today and uh, we okay. wish you all the best. Yeah, as yeah, we'll come back. The exam hall. And uh, you said? I have some questions. <laughs> But I, don't oh, know I, that. I mentioned if there are any other questions, I didn't get any response. And that was why I did my survey. Yeah, What's the question? Is. What's the question? Man, say it's on, there are some terms under uh, upstream in petroleum industry. Uh, uh, technology, uh, technology allowance and concession system, uh, race service contract, pure service contract. Those and, and then you the, can the money the, we have stability agreement uh, development agreement all those things are in the principal documents you can read them we put them in the principal documents so you can uh, read them in the principal document there is stability agreement in the principal documents there is development agreement in the principal documents there is pure service contracts in the principal document concessory system all of those terminologies are in the principal documents so you can get them in the principal documents and they are one-liner definitions that you must know about today. Okay, so that's it. Uh, we wish you all the best as you go in the exam hall. Like I said, take time, read the questions, understand the requirements of the question very well before you start the write, especially with the written and comment ones. Read a question, understand the requirements before you start the write. And uh, if you do that, you should be able to go in there and pass the examination. So that's it about that. All the best, and uh, we will see you again some other time. Bye-bye.